Yeah, right. Thank you. Ah, oh, yay. All right, well, we get to talk about worship, which I love, and so I'm really excited about what we're going to talk about today, and um, it's going to have a little bit of a fun uh, uh, aspect to it. I'm going to show a fun video, and I'm going to share stories, and so um, we just had this like really intense like worship time, intense prayer time, but we're just going to shift because there are so many different sides of God, so um, Alex, if you want to show this video... We're going to talk about today is about our physical demonstration to God in worship. So we're going to start with um, just a little bit of instruction for you. If you're not sure, you know, maybe it's a little bit out of your comfort zone to um, use your body to worship God in demonstrative ways, this video will help you out. And I know that each church has its own worship style, you know, which is cool. Some people are more expressive in worship, some people more subtle, and it's all good. Um, I go to a church that's pretty expressive in worship. It's, um, it's a hand-raising church. That's what it is, right? That's what, you know. Anybody here go to a hand-raising church? Am I here? Sweet. Who here does not go to a hand-raising church? <laughs> some of you are trying. You're like, I can't. I want to, Tim. I need to get some momentum. <laughs> totally cool. But hey, if you're not used to going to a hand-raising church, you want to go and join us, feel free to join us, but don't feel like you've got to join right in, okay? Start slow. We've got a lot of different hand-raises that we use. We actually have names for our hand-raises. So I'm going to walk you through real quick, okay, what they are, just to let you know. Say you're at my church, music is rocking, start slow, hands in the pockets, a little elbow flap, you're fine. Very subtle. Get warmed up. Get your heart rate up. When you're warmed up, start with the first one. Ready? Carry the TV. Carry the TV. That's our first one. Very subtle. Go to big screen. Big screen, a little wider. Next one's my fish was this big. My fish was this big. If you're a liar, you can go out there. That's fine. Don't worry about it. Jesus loves you. Grace. Next one's hold my baby. Hold my baby. Got dueling light bulbs. That's our next one, dueling light bulbs. We got goalpost. Everybody knows goalpost. Throwing a heartburn. A lot of people like to do heartburn. Double heartburn, right back to goalpost. What's my favorite? Mufasa. Mufasa, that's my favorite. The circle of life. Tim, can you go higher? Yes, you can. You can take one hand, go a bunch of different stuff. Pointer, hatchet, schoolroom. <laughs> Release the doves, give the Lord a high five. Press it out. A lot of women like to wash the window. Wash the window. <laughs> and when you're comfortable there, go for the big three. Village people, Rocky, touchdown. There you go. There's your big three. You're set. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> Oh, so this morning, we are not going through all of those different examples, um, but I just wanted to kind of come at it from a non-serious point of view first, um, because this can be a little bit of tension um, if people have been around church that I don't worship the same style as someone else, so I must be not as spiritual as them, or something like that. It's almost like we put ourselves on a scale depending on how free, how physically demonstrative we are in worship. And I just want to take that off. This morning, we're not going to leave from here and go, okay, next week, now who's being really crazy in worship? They must be, like, super free. And because I'm sitting here, there must be something wrong with me. No, not at all. Today, what I want to do is just to hear God's heart. He gave us a physical body right? Like we're not just sitting here thinking and not expressing anything, right? In the natural. So in worship, there has to be truth. And that's what I'm going to be going after today. And I want to start with a scripture um, we find in Isaiah chapter 29. So if you have some form of scripture, whether it's digital or paper, let's look at that together. <clears throat> Isaiah 29. 
verse 13 and 14. And I want to look at this because um, the enemy, the devil, loves to hold anything over us that he possibly can. And even at a place where we're supposed to be loved and accepted, where we're supposed to be able to open up to God, we get judged internally, right? And so I just want to look at the scripture that seems like it's judgmental, but what God's response to it is phenomenal. So here we are, Isaiah 29, verse 13. And this is God talking. In the Old Testament, when he talked, and there's quotation marks around it, pay attention. Because this was a time where his voice was reserved for people that were anointed by Holy Spirit, were reserved for his people, for the Israelites. After Jesus came, it says the Holy Spirit came, was poured out on all flesh, so we all get to hear God, we all get to prophesy. But in the Old Testament, when it says, then the Lord said, and there are quotation marks, Pay attention. This is important stuff. So here we go. Verse 13. Then the Lord said, Because this people draw near with their words and honor me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts far from me, and their reverence for me consists of tradition learned by rote. And I usually would stop there. Like I would just read that and go, Oh my goodness, God, help me not to just say what the right words are, not just talk, but have my heart be close to you. I don't want this verse to be true about me, that my heart is far from you. And then I usually stop there, like, Oh, kind of get weighed down a little bit. But look at what God says. Verse 14. It's amazing. Therefore, behold, I will once again deal marvelously with this people wondrously marvelous and the wisdom of their wise men will perish and the discernment of their discerning men will be concealed and then it kind of goes into all these woe to this and woe to that but I want to look at verse 14 therefore behold I will once again deal marvelously with this people wondrously marvelous God puts it on himself to bring our hearts out in worship Isn't that awesome? He said, I will once again deal marvelously with this people. Now, this is about Israel. But again, looking at this message that's coming out from the Lord to this prophet Isaiah, that this people, they honor me with their words and their lip service, but they remove their hearts from me. God recognizes that the issue is that they don't know who God is. They've forgotten. This is coming at a season and a time that has been removed hundreds of years from miracles that set them free. And so over this period of time, they've lost track of who God is. They're looking at captivity. And so that fear of being in captivity is keeping them from being able to remember the God that set them free from Egypt, to remember the God that brought in a king that was able to bring back this glorious ability to worship God with Solomon's temple. Oh my goodness, like I can't even imagine how beautiful it was to have that be a place where you could go and meet with God. Incredible. This is being brought out to show that God wants to shake things up again. And that if you're feeling that for yourself, that you're, that first verse that we read, that I'm saying the words, but I'm not sure if my heart is close to you, you can ask God to show himself to be marvelous to you, to bring in the miracles, to bring in the wonder, to bring in the awe of him again. And seek after that. It's okay. It's okay to seek after what he has for you. That's who he is. He said, I am healer. I am the one who provides for you. Um, in worship when I was talking about our weakness and his greatness, some of us look at our um, pay stub or look at our abilities and we think, well, I can only survive on this amount. But God says, take your weakness and, sh- and show it to me so that I can be great in your weakness. We're not limited by those things. Okay, that's a side note. But what I see in this, in worship, that our physical response has to come from our heart. Otherwise, it's just elbow flaps, (laughs) like what we just watched. Like it's just us thinking, okay, this is the part of the song where you raise your hands, right? 
And that stirring up of that awe of who God is is where that physical demonstration comes from. And so I just want to share some of my worship experiences. Um, I grew up going to church. Um, My parents were first-generation Christians, so they were the first people in their family to live sold out to God, um, not worrying about anything else but just serving him. And so because of that, I grew up going to church. And um, the churches that I grew up going to would fit more in the category of what's called being Pentecostal. How many of you are familiar with what that means? Some of you? Okay, so Pentecostal means um, that in the Bible, when it talks about that after Jesus ascended to heaven, that he um, released Holy Spirit to be poured out on all flesh. And you can read about it in Acts chapter 2, that he was poured out and crazy things happened. Um, And so because of that, um, the church that I grew up with expected crazy things to happen in service. When we came together, um, we just expected that God would do crazy things. Um, And so my, uh, one of the churches I went to um, when I was around 10 years old until um, high school when I left and went to college, um, people would be dancing, people would be uh, what's called slain in the spirit. So they would receive prayer and they would fall out because their physical body couldn't stand anymore. Um, And it would just kind of get crazy. And so growing up in that environment, I was very hesitant. I did not want to just dance in the aisle of the church. And I remember um, the people that did dance in the aisle, they wanted you to dance with them in the aisle in my church growing up. So they would like, come on, come on out. And I'd be like, "Mm -mm, no, I'm not going to do it Um, for years. Till finally one day I did. And it was really freeing. And then from then on, I had this like ability to hang out with the cool people who danced in the aisles. It was a little dysfunctional, (laughs) but that was kind of how I grew up. Um, Another aspect of um, the church that I grew up in um, was people raised their hands, and if you haven't ever raised your hands in worship, I encourage you just to try it. Close your eyes, pretend nobody's around you, and just lift your hands. The first time I did it, it felt so weird. It was just like, what am I doing? Everyone's looking at me. Everyone knows that I'm standing here, my hands are up, and they're wondering, when are you going to put your hands down? Because that's always like the question, right? Like, okay, now is it okay for me to put my hand down? I'm just kidding. Remember, this is going to be a fun message. Anyway, um, so I remember it was so weird. I was like, this is just so weird. And so when I lowered it down, I was like, is it okay to raise my hands again? Like, I just didn't know how you're supposed to do this. And I just want to encourage you, if you feel like that, it's okay to try things, but just follow what God is leading you to do. Because there's some times where you don't even think about it and your hand goes up. And there's some times when you know that this is a time where my body has to respond, and so this is the way that I'm going to respond. But I want to give you a clue to the rest of what I'm going to share with you today. A lot of it is cultural. A lot of what we come to be comfortable with in worship is culture. And so I just, again, I'm going to share some of the different cultures that I've been a part of just to show you the variety and the beauty that there is in the church across the world. And also to see what do we have in scripture as an example. Okay, so this was the church that I grew up in, um, and I remember the first time we sang kind of an intimate song. It was called Draw Me Close to You. Do any of you know that song, Draw Me Close to You? I was like, this is a love song. Why are we singing this to Jesus? Like, it felt super weird, because we had just sang songs, like, about God, and they were very powerful, and how strong he was, and then here we were singing, Draw Me Close to You, You're All I Want. It felt so weird. But now I write songs like that. (laughs) It just, sometimes the things that we feel weird about, it's just a transition. And once you transition, then you realize, wow, this is really about who God is and about who I am expressing that to him. I was part of a worship dance team at church. Um, It was awesome. Do you guys know the song, Shout to the Lord? I would do like, shout to the Lord, all the earth. And it was like all of us dancing with our big skirts and everything. It was really cool. It was really fun. Um, So we did that. Um, But I will say that most of the worship, um, and I grew up being a part of worship teams and like playing in youth group worship teams from when I was 13 years old until now still, it was all about singing the songs. And it was like assumed that if you sang a worship song, you were worshiping. Like you just 
read the words up there. Actually, it was a projector with the like thin slides that you would move up and down. You know what I'm talking about, right? Old school. If you read the, pro- I, I did the projector. How many of you did the projector at your church? Yeah, it's pretty awesome, right? You knew when to move it up so that people would know it was coming. Anyway, we just assumed that if you read or if you sang what was up on the screen that you were worshiping. But I believe that this is what that verse is talking about here, that we can't let our worship be from a screen. That has to be from our hearts. And so that's why God wants to reveal himself to us, that the words on the screen are just an overflow of what our heart response is to God. And it's the same with our physical expression. So uh, most everything was about the music um, until one year we had a new youth pastor that came and he told me, Worship is what happens between the songs. And that baffled me. It was like, mind blown. What? Like, I just had grown up singing songs, and I loved it. But I didn't realize that singing songs is like giving a Hallmark card to someone. Like, it's good, and it's beautiful, and you can take a professional expression of love and give it to someone. But we can't build a relationship on that, right? Right? Yeah, I can't, Ben can't build a relationship by giving me a card for every circumstance, right? I want to hear from him. I want to hear his heart. And so in worship, the words are a professional description of who God is, but it's not the end. The end is our expression of love to God and our receiving of what he has for us. So that was crazy for me to realize, but it definitely put me on a journey to understand more. Then I went to Bible school in 1999. I'm 35, if you're wondering. I went to Bible school in 1999, and in this, um, and I was studying music, so I went there for church music, and in this environment, being separated from my home environment, from my home church environment, I was able to contemplate why did I worship the way that I did. And what God kind of showed me, what I settled on, was the importance for worship to be thoughtful. That my mind would be engaged with what I was singing. My heart would be engaged. That I would recognize, wow, I'm singing that you're great. I believe that, God. I believe that you're great. And my heart is agreeing with what I'm singing right now. And as a little 18-year-old girl, that was really profound. And it sent me, again, on another journey to understand why how important it is for our minds to be engaged while we're worshiping God. And I remember I went to a church where someone sang a spontaneous song. They sang something that wasn't up on the screen, and I thought that was the craziest thing ever. It was so weird, but it was beautiful. I had to ask someone, is that, did they just make that up? And they said, yeah, I think so. And I was just blown away that you could make up songs and sing songs and make up to God. And now that's what I do all the time. So again, something that feels weird to you today may be like your norm later. So then um, from college, I was hired at a church that had experienced revival. This is what Ben was talking about. They had gone through a season where they had multiple church services during the week just because there were so many people coming to encounter God. People were getting radically saved. They were coming up front, taking the microphone out of the person that was speaking and confessing all their sins in front of everyone. They were getting healed. Divorces were stopped. Um, People that were just messed up, we're coming in and in a moment being transformed. Um, That's next week? What's next week? Oh, that's what we're doing next week. You get to come up and confess your sins next week. Yeah, right. Nobody will be here. (laughs) Uh, Anyway, um, and what was happening was their physical bodies were being so impacted by this tangible presence of God that you can read about in the Old Testament, the New Testament, where God would fill a place with his presence, um, which is a uh, weighty presence. It's talked about, um, the word is kabod, which is glory, and it's heavy, like it just rests in a place, and you feel like a, a lead apron is on you. And that's what would happen in these services, and the teenagers would go back to school, 
and their bodies wouldn't be able to handle it. They would be shaking in class, and their schools were experiencing revival in the schools themselves. And teenagers were coming back with their friends, and their friends were getting changed, and then their families were coming, and their families were getting changed. It was amazing. So all of this happened before I came there, and so I had never experienced anything like that. And so I came in, and I was leading worship, um, not like this, <laughs> but similar, um, back then. It was 2003. And they had been so impacted by the awe and the glory of God that they were used to doing celebratory songs to God, celebrating what he's done, celebrating being free, because they were so impacted by how God had set them free that now marriages, again, were restored. Their children, their teenagers were now totally wrecked for God and continuing on as adults now, seeking after God. It was awesome. But it was so out of my comfort zone. I just wasn't used to that style. And so I wasn't able to engage with that worship style until I went to an event um, that was in Kansas City. How many of you have heard of the International House of Prayer? You guys heard of that? Okay, we call it IHOP. It's not the Pancake House. Um, But the International House of Prayer. When I was there... The way that worship was presented was so impacting. It was not a performance. They were super highly skilled musicians, but they were worshiping from this place of intimacy and this place of knowing God because they have a 24-7 worship and prayer thing that's going on there since 1999, and it's still going on now where they just have worship and prayer 24-7 all the time. It's live webcast if you ever want to stream it in. It's so powerful. Um, But back then, 2003, it was something that was so new to me. And I remember um, when we were in worship that they sang the song, Trading My Sorrows. Again, I'm dating myself. How many of you know that song, Trading My Sorrows? I'm trading my sin for for the joy of the Lord, right? And when I sang that, it activated something in me that I have traded my sorrows for the joy of the Lord, and I couldn't help but dance. It was so different from when I was growing up, and I saw people dancing, and I was like, I should dance. Why don't I want to dance? I don't know, but I'm going to stand here until I know why, and I went out and danced anyway, but it was like my body couldn't stand still because I realized I have joy. I have joy, and I used to have sorrow, and I have joy, and it just like was this crazy expressive moment of worship for me, And it just clicked for me that when I understand truth and when I understand what I've been saved from, that my body wants to respond. You guys know what I'm talking about? (laughs) Like, you can't help it. It just comes from the inside out instead of you from the outside in telling yourself, you should be jumping, you should be lifting your hands, you should be singing the words on the screen, whatever it is, that from the inside out is how God calls our body into worship. So a couple more um, worship experiences. Um, We came in 2004 with our church um, when we were in Minnesota. We had a big bus. We had like 50 of us that came across the country. We came here to Harrisburg to Life Center, and we came to the Voice of the Apostles Conference in 2004. And um, if you're familiar with Global Awakening, that's an event that happens every fall. And um, so when we were there, the worship was super super weird. It was a worship band from Brazil, and they led worship like this. So they were on stage playing their guitars, playing their keyboards, playing their bass, on stage with their backs to everybody. And we were like, what is going on? And they sang the songs in Portuguese and English. So they would sing a verse in Portuguese, and then someone else would sing it in English. And they sang the same songs over and over and over and over and over and over. Like each song was like 30 minutes long. And the first night, worship was like an hour and a half, and they did like two or three songs. And I just kind of stood there and was like, what is happening? This is so weird. But it was intensely powerful. I remember there was a time when From the stage, they said, okay, we're going to split this side over here and this side over here. You guys face the middle this way. You guys face the middle this way. And we are going to usher in the presence of God down this aisle that we just made like a bridal procession. It was crazy. But when they did, it was like this heavenly presence filled the room. It's hard to describe. And when that was going on, 
I had my eyes closed, and I felt like I was supposed to move my hands like this, like both of my hands. So I was going like this from my belly to heaven, and I was like, God, this is weird. Why am I doing this? This is so weird. But as I had my eyes closed, all of a sudden it started to, like, become this path. And I, again, this is really weird. I'm putting myself out there to explain this to you. But this is what happened. And I saw in my mind's eyes, so in my imagination, I saw this path that was going from me to heaven. And I was like, God, what is this? And I kept moving my hands like this. And he said, it's an umbilical cord. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? All this is like I'm conversing with God about it. And he said that in worship, there's an exchange in the same way that an infant in mother's womb is exchanging the waste for the life, for the food, for the sustenance, for the blood. All of that takes place in the umbilical cord. It's one place. And so in worship, you're exchanging what you are never meant to carry. Like that's the definition of waste. It's something that your body isn't supposed to carry. And so you get rid of it. So with the baby, this is stuff that's not supposed to remain in the infant's body. And so it has to leave or it can't survive. In the same way, worship is necessary for us to exchange those things that we're never meant to carry. We won't survive if we don't have this exchange and to get from him the sustenance, to get the life, to get the presence that he has for us in worship. Isn't that awesome? That's his design. It's not us saying, oh, I'm so worn out, I need to worship. It's him saying, you were never meant to live without exchange in worship. This is what's supposed to happen. Isn't that awesome? So in worship, in that moment, again, I just felt like I was supposed to do this with my hands. And this continues on to this day. I'll feel like in worship, I'm supposed to do something with my hands. And then as my eyes are closed, I'll see something. And that is like a word of knowledge or something that God's releasing for that moment. And so, again, that's just my physical body reacting to what God's doing in worship. It's not me making something happen like, okay, God, Come on, you're up, so I'm going to do something, so you better reveal yourself to me. It's just an, a flow, a flow of what's going on inside of me with who he is. And then I just want to uh, share a little bit about different cultures. Um, I went to China in 2013, and there they have um, churches, but they're, they don't have a lot of musicians that know how to worship and so they worship to CDs so they listen to worship albums and they sing their hearts out and so one night um, they asked me to lead worship and so I was just playing the keyboard that they had just gotten and they were so loud they couldn't hear my voice <laughs> and um, I decided I didn't want to do the song the way it was in the CD but it didn't matter because they did it the way the song was done in the CD. So they just kept doing it the way that they had learned it. And so then I just had to catch up with them because that was just how they worshiped. So in the room, everyone's singing super loud all the time so that a leader is kind of just along for the ride. It's just the culture. And then in Brazil, I've been to Brazil twice, they are so fiery and so demonstrative in worship. They are jumping and yelling and they're just on fire like as they're worshiping and it's just the culture and it's so beautiful and um, we went to England here in March and they love to celebrate like think, think of like Celtic worship like Ren Collective like that's how they love to worship and so it was just beautiful and just fun but again it's not that one is better than the other okay that our worship isn't on a scale of how demonstrative we are physically but we see in scripture that there are expressions of our physical body in worship that are emphasized. So it says, I stretch out my hands to you. My soul longs for you as a parched land. This is just something that comes out of recognizing who we are and who he is. And not holding your physical body down is part of our yes to God. Of saying, God, I will say yes to you even with my body, I will say yes to you in worship with whatever you're impacting me with. I'm going to let my body follow through with what's going on, what you're revealing. <clears throat> and in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, we read, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Glorify God in your body. And so as I finish out this morning, I just want to leave that with you. God, how can I glorify you 
with my body. And more, like I kind of want to twist it a little bit to say, God, how can I let my body glorify you? How can I respond with my body for what I'm seeing inside of me? And then I just want to pray for us to have those encounters with God that bring out that awe, that marvelous expression of who God is. And I just see us holding hands with the people next to us. I know some of you might not know who's next to you, so I apologize. Um, If you don't feel comfortable, that's fine. Um, But I just see us releasing and agreeing that the marvelous expression of who God is would be released in our lives right now or in the future, that he would show himself to be who he is. So go ahead and reach out and grab the hand of the person next to you. I'll come over here, Kelsey. And I'm just going to pray for that. And as you're um, holding hands, I just um, encourage you just to say yes and say yes for them, God. Yes, I agree. So Father, I thank you for who you are. I thank you that you are a good, good Father, and that you have good gifts for us, that you gave Holy Spirit for us as a blessing. And so we want our physical expression of worship to come from that awareness, that recognition of who you are, that you are the miracle working God, that you release life, that you're the healer. And so we say yes to you, God, showing yourself to be faithful. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. We just activate who you are in our lives. Father, we say yes to you that we won't keep our physical bodies from holding back, from expressing what we see as truth from you, God, that we will glorify you with our bodies. We say yes to you, God. And Father, we just release more miracles, more amazing things to happen in the lives of these people around us. Thank you, God, that we wouldn't limit our expression or understanding of who you are. We want to encounter you for who you are, God. So we just say yes to you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. That was a pretty dangerous prayer. I hope you guys were okay with taking a risk to pray that way. I'm excited about it. Yeah. Um, So I want us to um, be able to do that which is coming up from inside of us. If you need to cry, cry. If you need to kneel, kneel. If you need to jump, jump. If you need to lift your hands, lift your hand. If you need to let a different song come out of your heart, let a different song come out of your heart. Like, again, this place is just a catalyst for your encounter with God. So I just want to bless you, and then um, we, have an, we have a song that we want to sing together. Do you want to do that right away or after you come up? We can do it after you come up. Okay. All right, so I'm going to pray, and then um, those of you that were playing the worship team this morning, we can come up and get ready, but we'll do that in a little bit. Yay. Oh, I had one more story I wanted to read. I'm sorry, you guys. (laughs) Okay, so last thing. 2 Samuel 6, 12 through 22, it's the story of David. And it says that it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him on account of the Ark of God. And the Ark of God was a place where God's presence rested in the Old Testament before Jesus came and ripped the veil. It's pretty awesome. So back then, this is what they had. This is God for them, the Ark of God. The house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. And so it was... Blah, 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 I'm skipping. So they brought it in. And David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. That was not what a king was supposed to be seen in outside the palace. So David and all the house of Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouting and the sound of the trumpet. Then it happened as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David that Michael, the daughter of Saul, who was his wife, looked out of the window and saw her husband... David, leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. So they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. And furthermore, he distributed to all the people. I'm skipping then. All the people left. And when David returned to bless his own house, Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, how the king of Israel distinguished himself today. That was sarcasm, if you didn't recognize that. He uncovered himself today in the eyes of his servants' maids as one of the foolish ones shamelessly uncovers himself. So David said to Michael, 
It was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all his house, ouch, to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore, I will celebrate before the Lord. I will be more lightly esteemed than this and will be humble in my own eyes. Um, And so what I just see from that is that God is our audience, that whatever we're doing, that it's before the Lord. It's not before us. It's not before, even if I'm on the stage singing, my audience is not who's sitting in the chairs. My audience is the Lord. And so anything that I am expressing in worship to him is before him. And so I also wanted to say, as worship comes from your heart, don't be surprised if your expression of worship changes as you build relationship with the Lord. Keep your eyes fixed on him and let your body express that to him. And then be ready for heaven to join in with you. That as you're worshiping, angels love to worship too. And that you might feel God's presence in different ways, through heat or through wind or just eyes open to what heaven is and what God's showing you. That's just because worship invites in heaven's presence. So don't worry about it. He's a good father, and he has good gifts for his kids. So now I want to pray a blessing, and then we'll um, finish up the rest of the service. So Father, thank you for who you are, and thank you that you gave us physical bodies that we can worship you, that we can glorify you, that we can show our affection to you, God. We can show the revelation of who you are and who you've made us to be with our physical bodies. And so, Lord, we do say yes. We say yes to you. We say yes to being able to glorify you and to be able to reveal your love as you are our audience, God, that we do all of this before you. We thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen.